Hello. Uh, thanks, John Deon, for this kind introduction. Um, sorry, I'm trying. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, thanks, John Deon, for your kind introduction. Uh, for Ingeniería Cero, it's always a pleasure to participate in this Diana training series. So, uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Ana Lorea from Ingeniería Cero, and I'm going to share you our work or our analysis in assessment of the risk of early age thermal cracking in a high speed rail viaduct. Okay. Okay, uh, first we'll have a quick look on the index of the presentation. We'll share our motivation on the scenario, our operating procedure and methodology, which are the sources of initial cracking, idealization of the structure and conditions in which we will explain geometry, construction process, stages, environmental condition, material properties, then we'll go on to the simulation and analysis and we'll present our heat flow and a stress coupled analysis in 2D, 3D model and also uh, the effects of post tensioning in transverse direction and in the end the assessment of the risk of cracking and then we'll go on to some conclusions. Okay, so first of all let's see where are we or which is the motivation of our, our study. Uh, in the picture, we can see this uh, high-speed viaduct. It is in the north of Spain, in the Basque Country, and it forms part of the lines of high-speed railway lines, which connect the three capital cities, which are San Sebastián, Bilbao, and Vitoria. In the photograph, we can see the construction of the piers for the long viaduct. And, okay. Uh, why are we proposing or studying the early age cracking during construction stages? Because uh, they have asked us that uh, suddenly or as they are um, constructing the viaduct, they have seen some cracks. Uh, the thing of these cracks, well, the viaduct is constructed span by span. We have here three photographs just to introduce and then we'll go on detail on the things. Um, these cracks are kind of uh, different cracks that we are used to see because are isolated cracks. You can see there in the right photograph. They are very small even in the photo appear big, uh, they are really small. Uh, they follow a pattern because in each span appears, well, in each, not in each, in some appears in other not, but with the same pattern. And, but they are not symmetrical. And also they are not a smear system of cracking. So uh, this is not the cracks we are used to deal with. And also in the area they appear, they appear next to the piers which are the area from, well, they appear in the bottom part of the deck, but in the area next to the piers in which the transverse reinforcement is high. So, and also they are longitudinal uh, cracks, which is sometimes strange. Okay, in the photograph, we can see the shoring system and how they go on stage by stage, span by span. And in the lower photograph, we can see the whole deck uh, constructed. Okay, so how would we face this problem or what will be our operation procedure? We'll go on the facts, we study the causes or the sources that could have caused these uh, crackings. We'll do the idealization of the structure, simulation, and then with the analysis. And with this, we'll get a conclusion. Um, first of all, uh, let's have a look at the viaduct. The highest speed rail viaduct has a total length of uh, 1,400 meters. They, it is one kilometer from the fixed abutment, which is uh, the abutment we have in the second line. It's a line for a speed of 300 kilometers per hour. It's ballastless track, 
okay, has a reinforced concrete um, slab track and is, as I have said, in the new high speed rail line in the north of Spain, which is called the Y because it's the, the shape of the line. Okay, so we'll study just the first part, which you have we have seen in the photograph that has been already been constructed, which is a total length of 600 meters. Uh, it is a post-tension concrete slab, a uh, voided slab with a total depth of 1.45 meters. It has polystyrene void formers and it has, even it has a 600 meters total length, it has 26 spans which are around or an average of 20, 22, 24 meters. Um, we can see on the image how these spans are distributed during the total length and the sections. Uh, the section over the supports or over the piers is a gross section in which the void formers are filled with concrete. It's a complete section. Okay. Uh, how is the construction process? The construction process, as we have said, is spine by spine using two truss girders sharing equipment. That was asked for the construction company because they can uh, support the temporary towers could be supported in the foundation of the bio. So there was no need to do additional uh, foundation for the shoring. Uh, in the project, it was uh, meant to be post tension each span after seven days or between seven and ten days of puring concrete. Uh, we can see below the elevation of the tendon profile, and on the plan, we can see how was the length of each span. Okay, in between the two blue lines. In the part which we have marked in red is where the cracks appear. Uh, there, I repeat myself, but there are longitudinal cracks. Well, transver oh, longitudinal cracks, yes. As it is uh, post tension in the longitudinal direction, that's why they couldn't be longitudinal, transverse. Okay. Okay, so possible or mostly probable causes. This is longitudinal cracking. As I have said, it's very small, less than 1.1 millimeters. There is not a structural problem because the limit of the transfer direction, which is reinforcement concrete from the Spanish standard is 0 0.3 millimeters. And this, as is the long, is the direction is longitudinal. It should be due to a transverse tensile effect. Okay, so it could be early age thermal cracking or to the expansion forces inducing by the post tensioning. Okay, as I said, this is a crack pattern, but not in all spans. So it leads to say that it could be a superposition of effects and an effect that has certain probability of occurrence. So sometimes happens, sometimes not. So as always, or oh, everyone has in mind, so they say, okay, what's being done at the construction site? What is exactly what they are doing? How are they doing the different steps and how are they curing the concrete? So uh, first they say that they were post in three or four days. So they are using a very high early strength cement. Okay, remember that the construction design was uh, was said to be in seven or ten days. Okay, we'll go on to the photographs and we see here. Now you can understand a little bit more the what we are seeing. The whole deck constructed. We see the cracks, the longitudinal cracks, isolated, following a pattern, but not symmetrically. And uh, we see the shorings and we also, the cranes are placing in this photograph, the void formers. Okay, so uh, we go on to the working site and uh, we made some drill holes across the cracks in order to see how they uh, develop in the depth of the deck. We see that they are very small uh, less than 1.1 millimeters. Um, when we drill the holes, 
there was rain, there was water, as we can see in the lower photograph. There was water, it was, well, in the north of Spain it's rainy, mostly rainy, and there has been raining during the placement of the void formers. And the construction company told us that those void formers or polyethylene void formers were wet when they placed it onto the deck. So as we drilled the holes, the water came through these void formers. And also we can see in the fifth image that it was sealed. The cracks were very small and they don't go on depth to the deck. So if you see the white dot over there, there had already been sealed. Okay. This is the photos we get from the cracks. And now we started to look at how to modelize or how to simulate the problem, okay? We first, there is a really good standard, which Diana follows, which is a standard specifications for concrete structures from the Japan Society of Civil Engineers. There's a guide in which you can find the verification related to initial crack and the material properties. What it says is that the, ver the verification related to initial cracking is meant to be conducted at the design stage, but we recommend, or what ha always has to be done, is to compare if in the construction site or during the construction stage, it follows exactly what is done in the design state, which are the actual, the actual or the use material, the condition in which the concrete is being placed, that kind of environmental uh, factors that can be changed. Okay, so if we see in the flow chart they propose, uh, we have to start with environmental condition, determination, the shape and size of the structure, the construction method, the mixed proportion of concrete, determine the value limit and calculating the predictive value. We are doing this, but on the instead of on the down direction, in the up direction. So we have the facts and we have to, studying these kind of things, arrive up to a value and determine whether they are going to be worse or it's not a matter. Okay, so uh, for the thermal analysis and the stress analysis, we need all the material properties for heat transfer analysis and the mechanical properties of the concrete. Uh, we propose, first of all, uh, to do plain strain models, one which is from the support or the peer transfer cross section, and the other which is uh, from the void of the slab with the polyesterine void formers. Um, which, which is the sequence of the construction sequence of these models? Uh, we have uh, the first stage, which is uh, from, four, oh, from the start to four days. They say the post tension between the third or the fourth day. Okay, in this stage we are curing the or the well what is being done on site was the form work was placed and there was curing water. The deck has been uh, has been ponding with a permanent five or, between five or three centimeters of water permanently on the top side. Then between the four and the five day, the cure, they stop curing the water. And in the, um, from the fifth day, they uh, take off the form work. So this is the construction sequence they have followed on site and we were going to simulate. Um, related to the idealization, okay, the environmental conditions, we get the average temperature from the month, from the month it has been poured in concrete, and we have uh, two spans in which we have uh, measures and there were uh, lab tests of the concrete resistance, so we decided to study those two or this span which were the 16th and the 19th. The ambient temperature was uh, 14 degrees or uh, 11 degrees. The concrete was 43 degrees uh, plus the temperature which was in, in ambient, which were uh, 17 and 14 degrees. And the curing water was supplied by a constant temperature of 15 degrees. Okay, so we have the temperatures of the process. 
um, regarding to the material properties, the mechanical properties of the concrete, as I have said, we have the lab tests uh, with the construction site experiments that have the, the um, uh, compressing stress of concrete in five days and in 28 days. We have this here, 35 megapascals and 45 megapascals. And from the SPAR 19, we at four days, we get 39 megapascals and at seven days, 44 megapascals. So it was quite a very high, high strength uh, cement, which was uh, placed on site. Okay, we know that the tensile strength of the concrete develops with respect to the concrete age and can be estimated by this formula in which we place there. Okay, also the young modulus of concrete uh, development with time and with the development of the compressive strength. So all of these parameters were calculated based on the results of the last lab test we, we have. So we get those curves when, in which we see the um, compressive, the development of the compressive strength of concrete in time. Okay, after having these mechanical properties of concrete, uh, we go into the thermal properties of concrete. As I have said, they ha there was a high early strength Portland cement and we calculate the adiabatic temperature rise of concrete. It depends on the materials, on the mixed proportion of concrete, and the temperature of placing. We make the curves, and then with the data we have for our viaduct, we make our uh, particular uh, curves. We can, here we can see the high early strength polar cement depending on the time of placement with, oh, sorry, with the temperature of placement, which was 10 degrees, 20 degrees, or 30 degrees. In our viaduct, we have 17 degrees and a, a portion of cement of 372 kilograms mm, meter per cubic. So this was our uh, adiabatic temperature rise from our concrete that which in, we introduced in the program. And the other thermal properties of concrete that maybe or we assume that were constant because uh, the thermal properties of cement paste vary depending on the progress of hydration and water content, but the thermal properties of aggregate are constant. So the major part of the volume of the concrete is aggregate. So they recommend to make it constant. We introduce the thermal conductivity, the specific heat, the thermal diffusivity. These are the parameters that have to be entered in the model. The, also for the other materials which were or that we modelize or we simulate, which was the polyesterine void formers. We have the your modulars, thermal conductivity, mass density, thermal capacity, and thermal expansion coefficient. Also for the form work we represent in the model, we have the thermal conductivity, the thickness, and the convection coefficient, and from the air, which we have the convection coefficient. Those two, well, related to form work and air, we represent it like a boundary condition, okay, in which you can transfer heat. Here is again the construction sequence, but after having seen all the parameters we have entered, we can understand a little bit more. We have a condition, we an initial temperature field, which is the ambient temperature of 15 degrees. Then the porid concrete, which temperature was the ambient plus three degrees. We have the curing water, which we modelize as a boundary with a fixed temperature because uh, we have a bonding of three, five centimeters. Then we post tension the slab and then we remove the curing water and then we remove the from work. Okay, so with this construction sequence, we enter to the results of the analysis. It was, a two, as I have said, it's a, a 2D plane strain model. And for the typical void section, we get from the first day, we get the maximum temperature of the process. 
And in this image, we can see with the temperature in the nucleus, in the core, was 66 degrees. And on the outer part, it was 33 degrees. OK. Um, we can see the temperature gradient, which is induced by the heating of the concrete between the inner part and the outer part. Uh, on the fourth day, we go on to the degree of reaction, degree of reaction, which is uh, what it indicates is the maturity of the concrete. So we see that in the inner part, we, it's nearly one. Meanwhile, in the outer part is 0.93. And below the voids where the cracks have been placed, it's 0.9. It's less maturity than in the inner part. OK. Uh, seeing or what, having a look at the values of the transverse tensile stresses, we have under the voids, we have 1.6 megapascals. Is the part in which are placed the cracks and in which the tension is or the tensile stress is higher. OK. So related to the heating period, uh, we see that the, in the first stages on the early ages, just the, the concrete with a, an age of one day, the temperature of the core of the mass concrete is higher due to the heat hydration, so expansion will occur or is occurring. Uh, this expansion is restrained by the cooler exterior that does not spawn as rapidly as the core. The restraint causes compressive stress to develop of the core and tensile stresses at the surface, as we see in these results, and thus increases the cracking potential, okay, close to the surface of concrete. So as heating occurs, the, sur the surface is subject to tensile stresses and the center of the pore gets hotter and expands to a greater extent, okay? We see how the stresses develop on time and if we have a look at the eight day, well, the 28th day, the transverse are disappear and are in a compressive stresses. So negative stresses we can see here. So that indicates that if something has happened due to the tensile stress, it's going to close. Or if the crack has opened, it's going to close and it's in better condition. Okay, as time goes by. Um, Looking at the transverse displacement, uh, we see that for the fourth day, the, um, if we have a look at the numbers below in, under the void, it has moved uh, zero, this is in millimeters. It's very small movement, but we'll see after comparing with the gross section, we'll see why are we having a look at this. Okay, it has uh, expand and in the 20th, 20th day, the transfer is not expanding but uh, compressing. Okay, looking the other section, the gross section over the piers, we see how the temperature goes. We uh, see the gradient temperature and also how the inner core is a 68 degrees and the outer part is a 35 degrees. Uh, we also have a look at the transverse displacement. We see that expand in the fourth day and in the 20th day he is contracting. And okay, let's uh, assess, make some assess or some after seeing that images, some 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 results or conclusions. Uh, related to the temperature control, the temperature limit in the mass concrete to prevent delay heterogeneous formation is 70 degrees. So we have a max temper of 38 degrees, so we are in a safe, nearly, but in a safe place. Uh, regarding to the temperature gradient limit, which is recommended to be between 20 degrees and 35 degrees, to prevent initial cracking. It depends on the aggregate type, okay? Uh, here we have a maximum temperature gradient of 35. So we are uh, have or we are in the upper limit. So there is, a, in fact, there is a risk of early age thermal cracking. Okay, we see here the images in which we can see the maximum 
temperatures and the gradient. Um, also, what we can see regarding to the degree of reaction of concrete or the hardening or maturity of concrete is that the, the degree of reaction under the voids and it's low that in the inner. So it all has lower strength, uh, compressive strength. It has lower tensile strength. So that increases the risk of early age thermal clack under the voids. And also, if we add the um, transfer tensile stress due to what's expected to be due to the expansion of post-tension in force, it increases that, uh, that uh, effect. Okay. Um, regarding to the transfer tensile stress, we see also that even in, is in the first day, we had it higher under the voids. And if we look at the transverse expansion and we compare the two sections, we have the void section and the um, gross section, we see that even they have the um, same behavior with expansion or compression, they have different values. So uh, it, it has to be a 3D effect in which expansion is restrained one, from one section to the other. So this restraint induces compressive or intensive stress, which increases the cracking potential. So that's why we made a 3D model, a heat transfer and a stress couple analysis in three dimensions. Okay, so our um, 3D model, as I have said, was made to corroborate the transverse behavior, the effects or the tensile stress due to the compatibility of movements or deformation between the two different transverse sections. We did the same type of analysis and the parameters that in 2D. And we can see that the maximum temperature has the same temperature values with this 60, 60s. 67. And also what we can see here, and which is interesting, is the longitudinal temperature gradient that even is um, it's clear, but numerically is it's proof here, we could say. So um, this longitudinal uh, gradient produces a different uh, transverse tensile stresses or the needed of compatibility of this uh, deformation between sections. The fourth day temperature, we see how it's decreasing, but has the longitudinal gradient and the 23rd day or 24th. Mm, if we look at the 3D model and we look at the principal stresses, we see that in the area, these are principal stresses, but uh, the transfer, the main area with the transfer tensile stresses are produces under the voids and next to the uh, support section. We can see in, in green in these images and we have a value of 0 0.9 megapascals. Uh, also having a look at the degree of reaction or with the concrete equivalent age, we have that uh, in this area of a study in which the cracks have appeared, it has a uh, 1.6 days. And with this, we enter, okay, with these values, we can enter to the formula uh, to determine the prediction of cracking. Also, uh, we have a look at the other 3D model in which we have the, all the construction process represented, all the tendons and the span by a span, and we have the influence on the post-tensioning of one span into the others uh, which have been post-tensioned before. Uh, we have here two spans. In one, we have the maximum, it's a symmetrical, the, red line is the symmetrical axis and the longitudinal axis of the viaduct. So in the span center, we have the tensile stresses, which are lower than 1.5 megapascals. And in the area of which the stress, which the cracks have appeared, the tensile stress is around 0.3 megapascals. So it's very low in this area and it tends to decrease on the long term. In the image below, we have the results from the long term and we see that they tend to, to, to decrease. 
So if we enter with these values, with the maximum tensile stress, with the resistant tensile stress from the concrete in this age, uh, we have a factor of safety which is 1.55. If we go to the table of the probability of occurrence of cracking, uh, we have a 25%, which we increases a little bit with the post-tension transfer effect. Okay, so there is a possibility and 13, 13 only that happens that uh, cracking in the early ages. Um, what we can say also is that as the post-tension effect decreases in time, we think that it's not critical, okay, and also with the live loads uh, uh, applied on the deck, it, it makes this a uh, moment, so the bottom part of the deck is under compression. So it's not a thing to worry, but it's a thing to control. And just uh, to end some conclusions, that initial cracking should be accounted for accurate performance of the structures, that early age thermal cracking plays a significant role in initial cracking. It's not super critical, but it influences the long-term durability of the structure that advanced software empowers engineers to produce adjusted prediction to nonlinear concrete behavior in the early ages and long-term behavior, that the YANA software allows the analysis of all construction stages from early cracking risk analysis to ultimate limit capacity prediction. And nowadays, thanks to the capability of solvers and computers, we can define, analyze, simulate the nonlinear behavior of complete structures with a reasonable calculation time for professional project practice. And thanks a lot for your attention.